Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? I want to just make sure. OK, so before we get started, we have just a little video to get you in the mood for our program, The Need for Speed. Jeff? Detroit Flagway, a grand opening Saturday night spectacular. Pete Seaton's fantastic fuel-burning Chevrolet, Seaton's Shaker. Battling the king of the Hemi engines, the Ram Chargers Dodge. Pete Seaton says, my Chevy's going to blow the Ram Chargers off this Saturday, and all Mopar drivers will be buying Chevrolets on Monday morning. Chevrolet versus Mopar in a factory showdown. Extra, the first Harry Oldsmobile. A 66 Oldsmobile, a supercharged engine in front, another engine in the back, a driver strapped in between. It rockets off the starting line, smoking all four wheels at Detroit Dragway. Chevrolet at Dix. Racing begins at 8 p.m. Saturday! Saturday night at Detroit Dragway! Saturday night at Detroit Dragway! From Tampa, Florida, driving his 190 mile an hour Chrysler fuel dragster, the Swamp Rat, the world champion himself, Don Garlitz, racing again. Pete Robinson, brand new, 890 pound dragster, powered by a supercharged Ford, a Nitro. His car is equipped with sensational rear wheel jacks. He brings the car to the starting line, raises both rear wheels, winds his Ford to 9,000 RPM, and releases Rocket to a lap time of eight seconds flat at Detroit Dragway. Simply at this. Racing begins at 8 p.m. So, if you grow up in the Detroit area, the man who says, Saturday night, Detroit Dragway, that's someone that we all heard on the radio. Um, I'm a little too young to have gone to Detroit Dragway, or my parents wouldn't let me go, probably. But I bet some of these guys got to go. <laughs> so, I'm Mickey Maynard. I am the Reynolds Visiting Professor of Business Journalism here, and I've spent most of my career covering transportation. I was the Detroit bureau chief for the New York Times. I've covered autos for USA Today, for Reuters, and I am currently a contributor to Forbes. I've actually broadened my portfolio to include mobility, which is everything from people walking to biking to taking public transit, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. But I want to introduce these guys who I've all known for a long time. Um, first to my left, Matt DiLorenzo, who is currently the managing editor of Kelly Blue Book. But if you talk to anybody in Detroit, they would know him best as the editor of Auto Week. This is the guy that invented the North American Car and Truck of the Year Awards. This is somebody who, you say the name Matt DiLorenzo in Detroit, and everyone has a Matt DiLorenzo story. So you'll have to live up to that. So you may know Larry Edsel who is uh, adjunct faculty here at the Cronkite School. He was the managing editor of Auto Week, and for a few years, Matt was his boss. So I've heard wild and crazy stories about their editorial meetings. Um, both these guys are authors. Uh, right now, Larry is the editor of ClassicCars.com. So if you love classic cars, you definitely want to check out his website. And um, he's the author of a number of books, including a children's book, right? That's Yeah, that's, that's uh, being illustrated. Yeah, fantastic. And then last but definitely not least, Tom Kowaleski, who all of us have worked with through the years. Most recently, he was vice president of North American Corporate Communications for BMW. I've known him best as vice president of CorpCom for General Motors, a job I'm sure he is glad he doesn't have at this <laughs> moment in time. Um, he also had the job, the wonderful job, of being VP of Communication and Marketing for Chrysler in Europe. I went to a party at Tom's apartment in the 16th arrondissement of Paris that I can assure you was the most elegant auto show party I have ever been to. <laughs> um, Tom is currently uh, running his own firm and 
One of his clients is Ford, so he has the distinction of having worked with all three Detroit car companies. So I would like to start off tonight by asking the three of you, why cars? What hooked you on cars and why did you choose the auto industry as the focus of your career? So Matt, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I more or less backed into it in a way. Uh, I, I like cars. I worked on cars out of necessity more than a hobby to just keep them running uh, back in the day when you could work on your own cars. But I um, went to journalism school and like most journalism students, I thought, well, I'm going to end up working at a daily newspaper, which I did. I went to work for the Peoria Journal Star after I got out of uh, Bradley University covering cops and City Hall. And I remember looking across the newsroom one day at Art Andrews, who was 51 years old and still covering uh, the school board. And I said, do I really want to do this the rest of my life? So. When I had an opportunity uh, to, to uh, go to a trade magazine, um, I, I took it. It was, a, it was a small book called Automotive Fleet. It was a monthly uh, magazine. And it was a terrific uh, grounding in not only uh, a new uh, trade for me, you know, getting in covering cars, but also I learned about putting magazines together. It was a very small staff. I was taking pictures. I was writing stories. I was doing layouts. So I combined two, one of my loves was magazines in, in, in school, but I, I could never see my, my way of getting to, to a, a major magazine, and this was, this was the way in. Yeah. And as I, the more I worked, I, I moved up the, the chain to a larger trade magazine, or trade newspaper, uh, Automotive News. Uh, I worked for them in LA, I worked for them in Washington, DC, and finally ended up in Detroit as their international editor. Uh, that's when it began to dawn on me that this was really a cool place to work because the auto, my, my personal view is if you are tired or bored covering cars, that's your own problem because you have marketing, you have sales, you have engineering and technology. Design is like art, uh, sports with motor sports. You have government regulation. Uh, we're a mobile society, so cars are woven into the in, into our culture. So it, it it dawned on me that you know the the auto business is a lot bigger than what people perceive. And then when you also when you live in the Detroit area, it's the only game in town. So uh, I I really enjoyed my time in Detroit and the opportunity to travel globally, to go to international auto shows, to meet the movers and shakers in the industry. And uh, I don't think I would have been able to do that if I was um, sitting at it behind a desk covering a city hall meeting yeah. Uh, yeah. after 20 years. So, yeah. uh, and it, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a business journalism in general is something that you don't hear about when you come into J school as, as a possible career Except path. Except in my classes. That's why you're here, Mickey. Right. <laughs> so and these, these guys ended up working together, and Larry, I'd love to hear that story, how that well, came about. I, I didn't go in necessarily voluntarily. I was kind of, I feel like I was drafted. I was, uh, I, I, we're not supposed to say the word Northwestern here, but I went to Northwestern. And I was a daily newspaper sports editor, and that's what I wanted to be, was a sports editor. And one day my phone rang, and it was the publisher of Auto Week, Leon Mandel, and this voice says, can you come to lunch? And I said, yeah, why? And the next thing I heard was, because you're going to come to work for us and we have to talk about it. And I literally took the phone and went, is this man crazy? And three weeks later, I was at Auto Week as their motorsports editor. Wow. And most of the time I was there was, was managing editor. And it's a fascinating industry. And um, the thing I always remember most about starting out like that was um, I never had a passport as a sports editor. And when I was at Auto Week, we were on airplanes around the world all the time. Yeah. So it, it's a very global thing, and that, that was fun. Right. Yeah. And obviously, Tom, you've worked all over the place, so tell us a little bit about how you got into this. Yeah, I, a, lot of it, a lot of it parallels how, uh, how Matt got in. Um, I grew up as an only child in a very small town of 7,000 people in a little town in Ohio and uh, started reading car magazines back when I was 9 or 10 years old. And they became sort of my window of the world. 
Um, I would read these wonderful stories about driving cars through the Alps in Switzerland or going down to the Riviera. And uh, it was a wonderful form of journalism, the enthusiast magazines uh, back in the late 60s, mid to late 60s, in the sense that it was also a travel log as much as it was an education about cars. And it just hit me is that this is a wonderful business to see the world. So that was the personal reason I got into it. But very quickly after I did get into the business, what also hit me was this is an industry that infects the entire world. Um, it touches governments, it touches economies, it has huge financial impacts. If you're a society that's growing, one of the things where you've made your mark is now reaching a level of maturity is to have an indigenous auto industry. Um, it, as Matt mentioned, it touches regulations. And so very quickly you realize you are not just in the car business, but you are in the world business. And from a business journalism standpoint and a business communication standpoint, I think it's one of the most dynamic businesses you could ever be in. One of the things that I've noticed since I've been covering the auto industry, though, is how fast the coverage has changed. So back in the old days, even 20 years ago, um, you had this pecking order. You had the buff books, which were road and track, car and driver, later automobile. They had longer deadlines. So they would get information first. They would get the photos first. They would get to drive the cars first. And then maybe Tom can correct me on this, but beyond the buff books, you would have the big newspapers, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. You would then have the free press and the news in Detroit. You'd have the wire services. And then you'd have kind of all these other folks around the auto industry. Now, we not only have all those players still, but we have 24-hour news, we have the web, and we have all kinds of blogging sites like jalopnik.com, where I worked for a while. Um, we have people who are just freelancers who declare themselves to be car reviewers. So I want to start with Tom on this. How has this crazy change in the landscape affect what you do for a living? It affects it, uh, it, affects it tremendously uh, because uh, news is now created, just as you say, Mickey, news is created now in places that you would never dream of. And something that um, we're also watching, too, is you no longer have to be the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal to create a national news story. And because of the proliferation of all these sites, I mean, we are probably all spend part of our day the way we get information, I know it's the way I do, is read aggregated sites. And aggregated sites pull in information from a lot of those, from a lot of those outlets, yeah. publications, that you would never find on your own, but they impact you, they influence you, and uh, they are passed along. And once they're passed along, they get into the stream of consciousness as well. So from an industry standpoint, it makes our lives very difficult in that uh, we've got to constantly pick and choose, uh, but more and more as industries are self-publishing, that self-publishing goes up for anybody to pick and to aggregate as well. So in one way, in terms of building relationships, it's never been more difficult, yeah. but in the other way of disseminating information and being able to tell stories, it's never been easier. Um, Larry, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I, I am bothered um, by the fact that there's, there is a group of so-called freelancers mm -hmm. who are kind of making their living going from press trip to press trip to press trip to press trip. Um, and I, I'm curious how, how the car companies feel about that group. So let me just um, interject yeah. a little bit to explain to you guys what a press trip is. So. Um, the car companies, when they have new cars, put on a, a trip. They put on a junket, and a lot of times it's in a very beautiful place. It'll be in Switzerland or Buenos Aires or Italy, and they set up a drive so that car reviewers can, I know it sounds cool, doesn't it, guys? Um, so car reviewers can drive the cars, and then they may arrange access with senior executives a lot of times. So the ethics of these press trips are different for a lot of news organizations. And working at USA Today and the New York Times, I was not allowed to go on them. If I did go on them, we had to reimburse the car companies for the cost of the trip. 
Um, but other publications allow people to take the trips. And I want to hear everybody talk about this subject, because from the point of view of the traditional media, you just can't take a free hotel. You can't take a free plane ticket to Milan. But there are other points of view on that. So I want to hear from everybody on that. It, 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 uh, maybe what I'll do first is, is let me answer Larry's question, yeah. which is a, a, any company, Larry, I've been associated with, we've never significantly expanded the list of people we would invite. So it's always stayed pretty close to the publications that traditionally carry the influence, that have the space, that have the coverage. Um, what, where you would pay attention to this ever burgeoning list would be who has access to your test cars, you know, once the car is launched, you know, because we kept fleets in different places around the country. So that always put more of a tax now on the use of those vehicles, but it's never really fundamentally changed the trips. Sorry, but that was okay. Just so you were you able to? I went on junkets. Take those junkets, <laughs> Matt. So how do you live with yourself? Um, <laughs> the same way travel writers and uh, entertainment writers. I mean, that's where the junkets came mm -hmm. from. And I think the economics of a lot of the um, the, the car books, um, uh, especially the smaller ones, if they had to pay to go to all these places that the car companies were going, it just wouldn't pencil. Um, we didn't necessarily, we didn't, we tried for as much transparency. I think if anybody asks us who was paying, we, we you know, the, the car companies were. We asked not to be treated any differently than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and after a while going, you know, you want to drive the car and if they're trying to impress us by, by taking us to Nice for 24 hours and you're flying 12 hours on a flight and 12 hours back, it, it, it begins to wear thin a little bit. I mean, it, it, it may look glamorous, but after a while, a lot of these trips, you're on the ground in some other country for less than 36 hours. And a lot of times they do it for their own convenience. If it's a global launch, they'll want to do it in Europe, especially the Germans. And they're famous for sticking you on a plane and then you get there and then you go right into a technical it's presentation. It's been known as the Bataan death march of the automobile yeah. business. So oh. the, it's up and down. I mean, if- First if, world problems, Yeah, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, to that point too, I think part of it is the enthusiast, um, um, uh, media or publications, I think they're enthusiasts first. They're, they're, they're buff books and they're not consumer reports. Consumer reports and goes out and buys their own cars. So that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, a lot of the publications drive the cars on loan from the manufacturers. So it just depends on how finely you want to slice this. So I want to hear Tom talk about this because I've always wondered what your expectations are if you put on a trip to Spain and you're giving access to your CEO and you're giving access to the car first. What do you want out of that? In, in short, no different than if we drop the car off to you here tonight with a set of keys. I mean, anybody that gets into this business from, from the communication side of the business and thinks because um, you have taken somebody somewhere to drive a car and there's an expectation, um, one is um, that's extremely naive. Uh, and you don't need to be in this business very long to understand that. Now, I suspect that there probably are some people still in the communications business who expect that, but yeah. um, I started back in the business 30 some years ago and probably after the first trip we did like that, you understood what the game and how the game was played, which is there are no expectations. You're doing this for the most opportune way of getting as many people as possible through a product, giving them the access to executives and information so that uh, media have the opportunity and they have the tools to do the job right. Uh, and quite frankly, over the years, I very much always wanted to say, kind of say, is, is there a way that we can get around not having to do this this way? Mm -hmm. But what comes is that this also is part of how a lot of media outlets continue to make their budgets work 
when their budgets are not that large, too. And I think, you know, maybe there's something we can talk about tonight. There might be some kind of a solution to propose. Well, so, uh, you know, from the side of journalism that wasn't allowed to do these, you hear of all kinds of abuses of it. So I'll oh, sure. give you guys a couple of examples. There was uh, a reporter that I knew in Detroit that didn't own a car because he had a different press car every week. The cars would arrive at the office and he'd go off and you know, bring it back and the next car would come. And you always would book these cars with the company and you never had to own a car. Then there's the famous story of the Italian journalists. Um, you guys, okay, he's laughing, he knows this. So it's traditional when you go on these programs to get swag. So there's always a little gift for you waiting in the hotel room. And apparently there was a Fiat trip. I think it was Fiat. And they had a nice gift for everybody. and there was a little sign that said, please enjoy this as a souvenir of your trip. They happened to put the gift on top of the TV sets in the room. So the next morning, the Italian journalists went down to the lobby, each one carrying a TV set. <laughs> um, and apparently, the company paid for the TV sets because the little sign said you can have a TV set. Now, does any of this stuff, I, I mean, is anybody swayed by this kind of thing? I mean, do you see any 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 effect of this? I, I think we, I know at Auto Week, we tried really hard not to be affected by it. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, you had to go on the trip because the key was the access to the executive, not only to the cars, yeah. but especially to yeah. the executives, and particularly the chief engineer and the chief designer. Right. Because to do a good story, you had to have access to them. And what we did with the swag at Auto Week was we would bring it back, put it in a closet, and at the end of the year, we would give it to readers. We didn't keep ah, any of it. Okay. And that was a strict yeah. policy because it was just yeah. a violation of basic journalism ethics. Yeah. Okay, Matt. And I, and I think that's, that's kind of a thing of the past now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they may give out hats and shirts, but they give out hats and shirts at yeah. w wherever. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, and I end up giving all that stuff to, there's a lot of people who, uh, go to Goodwill or are wearing Aston Martin hats and shirts and yeah. things yeah, in my neighborhood. Or, or it may be a pen, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right, and or now, pen, but now it, what's yeah. happening is, is, is if someone gives away something cool at the Detroit Auto Show, it's on eBay within that night. That yeah. night. Press kits. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Press kits are, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so at this point, it's almost becoming a money-making opportunity for some people. In well, and, and what's really funny, too, is, I mean, I, I have seen um, not only a pen taken, but I have seen people when the after the press conference is over, yeah. those who have had their own pens and left them on the table, I've seen people walk by and collect all the rest of the pens. Oh so my gosh. not only did they get one, but they walk out with ten. Wow. So you know there are there are people who will always abuse privilege, right. and and I think we live in a real world. And because one is a journalist, or one is a communications person, or one is a lawyer or a doctor, we see abuses in every profession, and it goes on. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what happens when a car company gets into crisis. And right now it's General Motors' turn. Um, as you all might know, General Motors is under a cloud because of a big recall for ignitions on a series of cars, 2.2 million cars. Tomorrow the CEO of General Motors will testify before Congress. This is the highest uh, profile recall since Toyota in around 2009. So I was wondering if I, either of you guys have ever been involved in crisis coverage um, and what it's like on the inside when there's a big story that everybody is trying to get a piece of. Well, I think from the, um, the crisis point of view, um, well, a lot of this stuff is driven by DC. I was there. Uh, for a couple of years covering the, the auto industry. And you, you do have a, a particular dynamic set up between the car companies, uh, NHTSA, which is at point had been very adversarial, and independent groups like um, uh, Clarence Ditlow and the um, uh, Center, Center for, for Auto, auto Safety. safety. So that set up a very interesting dynamic, and then you would have you would have individual politicians who would either try to weigh in and make hay off of it, or try and cover uh, cover for the industry. So a lot of times it was almost like playing a game of telephone in in trying to get the real story of what's going on, and unfortunately. Um, 
uh, a lot of times it, it takes the courts to finally sort it out. That um, a lot of the testimonies and things that happen, the testimony that happens down in Washington, it takes the legal system really to get the real story of who did what and when. And as a reporter trying to cover this, um, trying to get the inside information is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think a key there is your relationship with the news source. Um, and if they, don't, if they don't know who you are, if they don't trust what you've done in the past, they are not gonna talk to you. Mm -hmm. And to get anything at all that, that's meaningful, you have to have that relationship. So, Tom, what's it like to be on the inside when one of these types of stories happens? Well, there's, there's um, you know, there are, there are two dynamics always at work. And uh, without getting into any details on GM, I think you would see it, those of you who are watching and reading the coverage of GM over the last month or so. And, and one, of these, one of these dynamics is um, companies would like to be um, – transparent because if they are not and they are not believed they do not have trust and if you don't trust the company generally you're not going to believe in a company and if you don't believe only when we have belief as human beings do we endorse do we pass along you know that famous phrase word of mouth the most powerful form of communications and the most powerful form of, of advertising so companies understand, and even if, they, even if they aren't necessarily transparent out of their own heart, they understand it's good business to be transparent. So that's one dynamic. Another dynamic, though, is the realities of business and the realities of the world in the environments and cultures in which you live. One of the realities here in America is this is a highly litigious society. And a lot of times the transparency that we would want to say, look, this is what's going on, what's happening. You are prohibited because all that does is you know that's going to create 10 years of lawsuits, and most of them may be baseless, to which it is still going to cost the company hundreds of millions of dollars to settle. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a competitive nature of this, is that this is really a tough business. It's a global business. There are 50-some or 30-some car companies doing business in America today, and everybody wants to eat everybody's lunch. I mean, if you... If you add up what companies internally think that their market share in sales will be each year, generally you come up with a market that's twice as large than the one we actually have. So, you know, it's really tough. So these two dynamics are always in play. And I think if you look at the situation with GM today, you're seeing that. Mary Barra, the new CEO of the company, has set a very transparent tone. Yet at the same time, they're probably not as transparent because there are legal issues that they have to work through step by step. Maybe they'll be able to find some way around those and become even more transparent. But these are this is this is the conflict you're always dealing with inside. And one of the things that's complicating all of this is there's is data, basically. One of the sure. things we're all learning yeah. about is data and journalism. And we saw an example of this recently in the General Motors recall where the Center for Auto Safety released some raw data on General Motors in these cars that showed instead of 12 people yes. dying that 303 people died. But as someone who's looked at this kind of data before, my immediate thought was this stuff isn't sorted properly. That there are, you know, someone could have died in one of these cars, but they could have died because they ran into a brick wall or they were drinking on the way home. And so one of the things as journalists, our responsibility increasingly is to find out Who's, what's their motivation for putting this stuff out there? And also, is this data that we can trust? And so the responsibilities for people covering the story just get bigger and bigger and bigger because people's lives are literally at stake. That was the FARS data you're talking yes. about, right? Yes. And so that is the number of fatalities in those cars. Right. But you realize that there are a multitude of ways, unfortunately, there could be a fatality in any car. So that's how that number grew very quickly. But I did see about two days of raw coverage of saying right. it's not 13, it could be 300, until it started to get pulled back by some more intelligent in thinking, and dare I say it, probably some journalists who have more care in what they were reporting to. Yeah, and that's what makes this industry so tricky to cover, because you've got so many different kinds of people who cover it for different reasons. Some people love cars. Some people are fascinated by manufacturing. I've been in 99 factories and 
you know, there I have no problems. But um, but I would like to hit number 100 at some point. <laughs> I wanted it to be Tesla, and they won't let me into the Tesla factory. But you have people who are interested in design. You have people who are interested in the heritage of the industry, and then you have people who just like the fact that it's going to get you on the front page. So you know, all of you have come to this industry for different reasons. Um, and that's true. And I, I think if you look, um, there have been uh, Pulitzers awarded to auto uh, journalists. Um, the first, um, or among the earliest, were, were Paul Ingrassia and, and uh, Joe, Joe White. White from mm -hmm. the Journal. And uh, Dan Neal received one for criticism, like a theater critic, the way that he, you know, we enjoy the way he, he reviews a car. He's, he's quite creative. So um, from that standpoint, there, there's a, a tremendous amount of talent out there writing about many different cars in many different ways. And there are those who are enthusiasts. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Peter Egan at Road and Track. He has a tremendous following. He's sort of the everyman enthusiast and, and has you know sort of a, a Garrison Keeler way about his writing style. So. Uh, it, it's it's really a tremendous um, uh, craft, really, and, and people have different roles to play. Reporters, writers, editors. Uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier about the self-publishing aspect. I think one of the big things facing automotive journalism is the commoditization of information. Press release comes out, there are many outlets out there, they end up writing the same thing. What is going to be demanded by a discriminating audience are, are, are journalists who are able to make sense of those releases and give more than, than, than just what comes out in a press release. And there will be editors, because I, I, I also believe that, that uh, the ranks have been thinned out, that you can't just rely on the reporter as the authority for the final story. It has to go through layers of editors. So even though the technology is changing, there still will be a tremendous opportunity out there for a lot of uh, uh, reporters and editors and, and people doing video uh, in the auto industry. Great. So now I have a question for you guys before I will let you guys ask us questions. Um, so I'd like to know in our audience, who owns a car? Wow, more than mm. I was expecting. Okay. It's a mobile society. Who walks to school? Okay, who takes light rail? Not a lot of light rail people. Maybe because we're at Cronkite. Um, who is a skateboard? See, there we go. And finally, who has a bike? Okay, so we got a few car owners here. I think the auto industry folks would be very happy to see the number of people in this crowd. But one of the things that everybody in Detroit is puzzling over are millennials and their supposed lack of interest in automobiles. Um, I have just written an ebook for Forbes that will be coming out in another week or so, all about the idea of rethinking the way we get around. So what I'd like to know from all of you is, is, is this a concern? Are people worried about you know this, this audience and cars? And if so, what do you think are some great ideas to get people interested in cars? Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of things here in the sake of discussion here. Um, we, have seen, we have seen the data show that today versus 10 years ago and 20 years ago, there are fewer people of driving age who are pursuing driver's licenses. Now, that number has come down, and I think it's, it's maybe topped, uh, it's gone into double, I think it's 10 years, there's 10% fewer people getting licenses today than there was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. if, I, if I remember one of these data points correctly. So from that standpoint, it, it is a concern. However, just like other data, you can take that data at a top line and report it and leave it alone, or else you can dig into that deeper. And what I think we're seeing, and what was really was surprising me too, Mickey, was the number of hands of people who drive, who drive here to class as well. But today what we're seeing is millennials going to school, working in urban environments, and not necessarily walking away from a car forever, but walking away from the need for a car either during the school period or early stages of their career. 
But just like other things that we've seen now post-recession that we were told as we went through the recession, oh, we've been changed forever, we're now starting to see come back. And so a lot of what I think the industry is looking at right now and how they're reacting right now is there is a postponement of getting driver's licenses. But there is not probably a postponement in the interest in automobiles or a postponement in the interest in brands. So what you're now starting to see is manufacturers pursuing other ways of mobility. And at BMW, we did a lot of this work with the BMW i brand. Mm -hmm. And we got into a venture capital firm. BMW started a venture capital firm to fund doing apps. And these apps were yeah. done for major cities in New York at the time when I was there so that we were providing you the access in New York and in the New York area to be mobile even if you didn't have a car and that carried a BMW identification with it. And the whole idea with this is, is then now BMW has started something called Drive Now, which is their own uh, zip car. Mm -hmm. And they started in Europe and they're now in San Francisco with it. And the whole idea is connecting that app. And so you're mobile when you're out of the car, but that app also connects you with a Drive Now BMW. That has nothing to do with buying a BMW. Right. You know, and buying a BMW may be off 10 years. But now what the car, enlightened car companies are saying, but even if you don't buy for 10 years, I have an opportunity to influence you and to have you get to know me better. And hopefully if I'm helping your mobility needs, you'll think well about me when the time comes. So I think that's one standpoint is we're seeing few people, fewer young people buying cars today, but we don't think it's forever from an industry standpoint. Okay. Um, I'll go from a, a, a different perspective. I've been spending a lot of time in the last four or five years covering the old car industry. Mm -hmm. um, classic cars, collector cars, auctions. And, and the people with those cars are fretting constantly about who's gonna take over my cars when I'm gone. Uh, um, yeah. You know, will there be another generation that's interested in old cars? Sure. And I keep telling them, yes, just be patient. Everybody still wants what they couldn't have in high school. And once you get to the point in your late 30s or early 40s where you can afford to go buy it, you're going to go buy it. And it won't be what people are collecting now. It'll be Datsuns and, and Mitsubishis and things like that. Mm -hmm. But there's a maturity that comes. And eventually those people are going to want Detroit muscle cars and they're going to want brass era cars and it's, it's going to take care of itself. But, um, but yeah, for the old car people, they are really worried about your generation. Sitting in traffic is a drag. You can love cars, but the act of commuting is not, you know, the, the most enlightening or fun thing to do in the world. So I, I, I see that. I mean, the millennials have it right. You know, you live in an in urban environment and you don't need a car, why have one? They're expensive. You have to pay insurance for them. And, and so if you can live without a car, you can live without a car uh, for a while. But it is a life stage thing. And at some point, you may move to the suburbs, you may you know, have kids, you'll, you'll want a car. And I think what will happen is that buyers will become more discriminating because they're gonna be putting off that first purchase of a new car. When they finally get to that point, they're gonna be really tough customers to deal with. And the auto manufacturers have to realize that, that, that they're not just gonna settle uh, for anything. And I think um, one of the things that I noticed in doing my research is that we now have choices. Um, as you were saying, buying a car is expensive, but we can get a zip car. There's two zip cars parked right behind Cronkite. Um, we can call Uber for a Lyft, or, or Lyft for a Lyft. We can, um, we can get a month-long rental from Enterprise and then just take it back when we're done with it. There's light rail, there's going to be bike sharing here in Phoenix. And so for the first time in a lot of places, the choice isn't just to own your own car, it's that you can do something else. And that's what I think the big revolution in thinking is for the auto industry. I'm not predicting that cars go away. You can't live in North Dakota probably and ride your bike. but we have other things to think about, yeah, and, which I, and, and, I think and, then makes everything that you guys write about and talk about more of a challenge. And, and there, is a, there is a freedom mobility that the automobile gives you, which is a wonderful freedom to have. I mean, if you take a look at, and I, and I always use the example of China, 
um, I started going to China in 1999, and I think I was about 10 years too late to make that first trip to really kind of see China get on wheels. But you know, once the fire of mobility, once the match was thrown on the fire of mobility, you take a look at China today and it's the largest auto market in the world. And it isn't because of some wonderful power that automakers have of being brilliant marketers, it's because the Chinese now understand the precious freedom of mobility. It takes you from the country to the city. Once you're in the city and you get sick of it, it takes you from the city back to the country again too. So this is the kind of thing that I think that we will put off at certain times when you start life in different ways, and now life is starting from a professional standpoint more and more in urban areas. And I think Matt's absolutely right. You know, it is a life stage now. We're starting to see some switches in life stage, but the lifestyle still is very much the same. Great. So uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from you, and I think we're going to wait for microphones so that we could, there's a microphone right there. Okay, so who would like to ask a question? What have we got? Someone raised their hand. Okay, right here. Hi, uh, this is it on? Oh, it is. Um, this is for Edsel. Uh, you had mentioned that you didn't like um, freelancers. Can you go into why? Well, it's not that I don't, don't like freelancers, I am one. Um, but, but, but there is a group of freelancers who um, I think kind of travel in a pack at the auto company's expense and um, I, I never see their stories but I know they're out there doing it and they won't go away. And I think one of the things they're doing is they're, they're taking up space that your generation or those who graduated five years ago should be out there having these opportunities but these old coots won't get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. And increasingly, you know, at one point in time, they are still doing the same thing. Sometimes in this business, I kind of call it the Rip Van Winkle philosophy here is, you know, we wake up, we fall asleep for 20 years, we wake up and we're still doing the same thing. Meanwhile, the world has moved on. And I think this is one of these things. There are, there are a group of people who are still writing, still thinking that they have the same outlets, but when they look, probably what they should do is look at their paycheck, as I'm sure, as you know, as the pay rate has changed radically today for freelancers from what it used to be, you know, without being able to have these trips that they go on, you know, they don't have a lot of income coming in to be able to do a lot right. of other things. It, and it's yeah. become a lifestyle for some yeah, people. Exactly. And, and yeah. I'm, I, what my problem is I don't think they're contributing anything anymore. They're, they're living off the system instead yeah. of contributing. Okay. There, I think there's one up here and there's one over here yeah. too. So. Thank you. Um, so I guess absolutely correct me if I have a wrong impression on this, but from people at least that I know who read about cars kind of read, um, for enjoyment, they just really enjoy cars. Um, but I guess editing a automotive magazine, how do you find the balance between the people who read it for enjoyment and then things like the GM recall where there's a lot of legal aspects and a lot of government involvement, do you find it any difficult to kind of take these things that people might not necessarily want to know about but people in the industry need to know about? Um, it's an interesting challenge, but again, it, it varies from outlet. And having worked at, at Automotive News, which was a strict trade publication, be very interested in the GM recall. Auto Week was, was more timely and it was a blend. It was for really the hardcore enthusiast. Um, I would say in the traditional sense, a, a road and track wouldn't necessarily be all over it unless we had an angle or an investigative report or something, which from time to time, magazines like that would, would, would get into, you know, like um, a lot of the stuff about fuel economy and those types of issues, there would be a deep dive. But on a breaking news story like that, in the traditional, um, in the traditional uh, buff book scenario, the news is breaking too fast to, to keep up with the, with the lead times. The other thing that I've always said too um, was I, I, when at Road and Track, we were enthusiastic about the automobile. We were buff books and we liked the idea of automobility. Uh, we would call them as we see them if we didn't like a car, but we generally liked cars in general. And I, and I use the comparison that you wouldn't 
read Cigar Aficionado to read the latest report on throat cancer or the Wine Spectator to read about alcoholism. So I think that there's a, there's a part of what you do as an enthusiast book that, you know, Consumer Reports, their job mission is totally different. And the problem I had was when people would come to me at Road and Track and say, why aren't you doing what Consumer Reports is doing? Well, my, my audience was totally different. And I think that that's one of the things um, that the internet is changing, that the, the buff books can go back to being more appealing to those hardcore enthusiasts than rather, be, than, rather than being a, a, a car guide. It's gonna be less profitable for them, but it can be profitable for them in the long run. Um, but the internet now is, has, has totally changed the car buying process to where the model where a car and driver road and track is relying on uh, in-market people and new car advertising to survive is, is over. You know, they're really struggling right now. If I can just add, I think what it comes down to is you have to know your audience, but you also kind of create your own audience by what you're doing. Uh, we have another one somewhere. There we go. Hi. Hi. Um, I'd like to bring back the concept uh, that Mr. Kowaleski brought up of freedom of mobility. Um, from what I know, that was one of the first things that ever got people buying cars when they were first introduced in the first place, you know, going west and pressure valve release and all that stuff. Uh, but now I guess it might be a completely different scene. Just how much of a factor is that freedom of mobility, that type of passion, a factor for why people buy cars? Well, well I can tell you that um, if you take a look at marketing of any car company or you look at marketing in general from car companies, yes, there are the rational points of, of advertising or experiential marketing or editorial communication or now known as earned communication. Um, there are the rational points. What's the fuel economy? How many people does it hold? You know, what's the luggage capacity? Uh, what are the quality ratings? You know, all the rational things. But at the same time, I don't think that there is a car company around anymore if they only thought that they could tell the rational story without the emotional story. And generally, the emotional story revolves around this whole idea of mobility. You can go there. Uh, to some with a sports car, with a top down, it's the wind in the face, it's the drive on the weekend. With others, with a family, it's getting away and seeing the country and seeing America. Um, the emotional impact of vehicles is still very strong and it all revolves around the freedom to go. And it is a precious freedom we have and more and more of the world is really starting to understand that with the growth of the automobile. And some markets that you would look at rationally and you say it really shouldn't grow. You know. China has now become the largest auto market in the world, and if you understand the rational infrastructure in China, it shouldn't be there. But it's this, this desire to get in the vehicle and go someplace. So I think it's still very much alive. And, and speaking of that rational and, and irrational and how things are going, even you look at the success of Tesla, and if you really look at that business model, there's a lot of irrationality built yeah. into a $100,000 electric vehicle that you have to charge and drive, but it taps in. So it shows that the, the passion or enthusiasm for automobiles just isn't, you know, zero to 60 times or big engines or, or racing or, or that, that the idea that I can be mobile and not be part of, you know, the pollution problem or anything like that, that has a real, you know, that the green element is going to become bigger. And wait till we get to autonomous cars. That's going to be a huge market. And I don't think it'll change things all that much because somebody will have to review these vehicles and say, this is why you want this one over that one, or this is the latest technology in, in autonomous driving. The, the three of you will remember, for a part of my career at GM, I lived under a regime of people coming into GM from not in the car business, thinking that they could take the emotional impact out of it and put only the rational impact in. We all know what happened to GM's loss of market share during those years. I think it was one of the most dramatic <laughs> that we had seen. I think one thing about Tesla, because we've talked a lot about it in my, um, in my issues in the economy class, um, Tesla is not just a car. Tesla is a tech 
play. Tesla, for the people who can pay seventy to one hundred thousand dollars, is the the new iPhone. It is you know the new the new Android. So you now have people in the auto industry who are not from the traditional motor oil in the veins background, people who are looking at this in a very high tech way. And this is the way that they've been able to express the ultimate, you know, a little phone or a car, you know, a car makes a greater statement. So that is something that everybody in the auto industry is looking at to say, what does this mean? What does this say about cars? What does this say about buyers? What does this say about the future of the industry? So so, I mean, to me, I think Tesla, as a car, they're only selling 20,000 of them, but as, a, as an event, it's a much larger event than many cars in the last 20 years. Plus, with the Tesla, you don't need motor oil. That's right. That's right. Uh, over here. I know that a traditional print media has to compete with broadcast news, for example, but few areas of journalism have to compete with an entertainment type show. So have you seen that since the popularity of Top Gear brings in a different type, a quirkier audience, a more broader audience than you would think of that is interested in cars? Have you seen car magazines and print journalism around automobiles change? Um, I, I don't think so. And I think that one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that people, at least back when I was growing up, they, they read the magazines for entertainment as much as they did for information and hard news. And I think in the 80s, they got away from that when they realized that if they ran wall-to-wall -wall sheet metal and just did car reviews, that um, they could get attract advertising. And I think that was a struggle that Larry and I faced, you know, just trying to make sure at, at Auto Week, we wanted to have those kinds of entertaining stories that, that made the magazine multi-dimensional, that it just wasn't a car buying guide. Top Gear has proven through video that, that uh, autos are entertaining as a, as a form of entertainment. They also have a magazine in England called Top Gear. They started first as a TV show, did the magazine, and Top Gear, the magazine in England, not Car, which was the traditional big dog uh, among car magazines in England off its pedestal. So it shows that, that um, popular culture like that can actually be a savior for some print properties, that if you can attract attention with, um, uh, with, a, with a video property, that you could actually build circulation. For a while at Auto Week, we had a, we had a TV show wasn't very good, <laughs> but it helped boost our circ. Our circ went up to 325,000 a week. But it was really time consuming for those of us who were doing it. <laughs> well, then they turned it over to the professionals. Yeah. Welcome to broadcast. <laughs> yeah. So what else over here? I was wondering what you guys think about the ethics of covering things that amateur drivers or like people like us would do that are also illegal and put the public safety at large like the cross country record or the lap of Manhattan record. I think it's, um, the, the, I've been asked to review a couple books by people who, who claim to have set cross country driving records and I refuse to do it because I, I think they're stupid. Um, you know, I, I think the speed limit is too low but by the same token, it's there for a reason. Um, one of the, one of the there's a ring road around Columbus, Ohio. And I remember for a while, they were actually keeping records on, on who could do the fastest lap around Columbus, Ohio. And it's just dangerous to drive like that on the street. And I don't think we should encourage it. And, and I can say that um, practically every car company I've worked with, at one point in time, somebody's come to us when one of these events was going on, such as the Cannonball, or now the gumball rally, and somebody would come and either call us or write us a proposal and say, we have this wonderful idea, give us a car and we'll get you all this publicity of doing it. Every single car company I've ever been with, we walked away from it because we didn't, we didn't think it was the right thing to do. On, on the other hand, if you go to a car company with a really good idea, for example, there's a group of 500 and some Mustangs that are gonna drive across the country in April as part of the 50th anniversary celebration, um, Ford will go out of its way to loan them yeah, definitely. a car or two yeah. to, to use yeah. on that trip to showcase their product. So if it's reasonable, even the car companies will support it. 
but woe be it if somebody, you know, really violates laws and starts going 120 miles an hour in one of those cars, too. I mean, the company would yank that car as oh, soon yeah. as they found out about it, too. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Anybody else? Okay, so I have a last question for all three of you. Um, what is the best recommendation you can make to this audience to get interested in covering the auto industry? One, one thought. I, I think the if you have a desire, there are so many outlets either uh, in the internet or in the trades to look at that. If there's, a, there's if there's a particular thing that you're interested in, pursue it. There's 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 a need for talented people out there in all aspects of it. Just don't you know don't necessarily go for the obvious that. I never thought I'd get here by working on a magazine called Automotive Fleet. So that's that's my my advice is is look at all possibilities. You never know where where it'll lead you. Um, I think you should start thinking about writing books immediately. Uh, it, don't put it off until you're 50 years old. Um, you can start writing books in college, right out of college. And there's, there's a market for them, and publishers love young writers. Think about books. I agree with what both of those guys say. And one thing I would add would be, uh, two things I would add would be, really understand great storytelling. Uh, it's no longer just the, uh, no longer just the intelligent organization of facts or a point of view, but it's a great story. And the second piece to that is also understand that more and more great storytelling is visual every bit as much as the written word, and maybe even more so. We live in a visual medium now unlike ever before. So I want to end by telling you about some of the people that I worked with at the New York Times and where they are now. Um, the predecessor, two, two bureau chiefs before me was a gentleman named Keith Bradshaw who uh, is kind of well known around Detroit because he wrote a lot about SUV safety. Keith has been in Hong Kong for the Times for about the last seven or eight years and frequently covers issues in China and has been lead reporter on the Malaysian airline story. Uh, my predecessor as Bureau Chief Danny Hakem is the new economics correspondent for the Times in London. Um, the young reporter who is our intern, Jeremy Peters, covers Congress for the Times, and my reporter, Nick Bunkley, is one of the reporters breaking all kinds of news on this big General Motors recall. So, uh, and, and I guess I could be a good example, too, of someone who went from the Times to National Public Radio and is now lucky enough to be here teaching all of you guys. So, see the auto industry as a component of your career, as a launching pad, and as a heck of a lot of fun. So, thank you all for joining us here tonight. Thank you.